been two years now since Grandma passed away. So we did a special chant for her now. And so let's dedicate the meditation to her as well. When you dedicate a meditation for someone else, you start out simply by thinking of that person. And as if you're talking to them, you say, okay, this is for you. And that way you're doing the meditation for both of you. It should be an extra encouragement to do it well. You're giving a gift. And of course, when you give a gift, you want to give something nice. You don't want to give something that's moth-eaten or dirty or full of holes. So in the same way, you want your concentration to be solid, smooth, and continuous. And each time you feel tempted to slip off, remind yourself, I'm doing this for someone else, so let's do it well. And at the end of the meditation, you make the same dedication. Okay, this is for you. May you be happy. May you enjoy the, the happiness that comes from the good that I've done. Because the goodness we do here as we practice doesn't have clear boundaries. You're not doing it just for yourself. You realize it in training your mind. You're helping others. At least you're making their lives lighter. You learn how to take care of yourself. You're less of a burden on them. If you're able to say no to your greed and aversion and delusion, they don't have to be exposed to your greed, aversion, and delusion. All of the goodness we do in the practice in terms of generosity, Virtue, concentration, discernment is the kind of goodness, the kind of happiness that spreads around, doesn't have clear boundaries. Which is what makes it special. So as the Buddha said, when you look after yourself, you're looking after others. When you look after others, you're looking after yourself. There's no clear boundary. In other words, when you're kind to others, when you develop goodwill and you actually act on that goodwill, you benefit, just as the other people benefit. When you are focused on your development of mindfulness and concentration, other people benefit too. So think of the meditation as a gift, both to yourself and to the people around you. And this is a major misunderstanding that people have, that we're just here for ourselves, we're selfish, parasitic, not doing anything for the world. But how much can you do for the world, and what are the best things that you can do for the world? We all know that we're suffering. And there's a lot of suffering that comes from external conditions. But as the Buddha said, the, the suffering that eats deep into the heart is the suffering that we create for ourselves. Each of us creates for him or herself. And so the best you can do is to learn how not to create that suffering, not to burden yourself down with it. And that way you set an example for others. If you're able to explain what you're doing so they can understand and apply that understanding, that's fine too. But even without that, the simple fact that you're showing that this is how it's done, like the Buddha images here at the front of the room, sitting there showing how it's done. Sit there with your, <clears throat> your legs crossed, your hands in your lap, and you look inside. So this is the part that you can pull out to show other people, but they will see the, the effects, the fact that you're able to calm the mind down. And 
when you're coming from a position of strength, you're a lot less likely to do unskillful things. And some people will sense that. And even if they don't consciously sense it, you are putting a different energy into the world. And that's a benefit as well. So what are you doing as you calm the mind down? Often we talk about working with the breath. Sometimes you have to just let the breath go. It's going to do whatever it's going to do. And you find a spot that, where you feel safe and secure. And just hold out there for a while. And watch. Because it's only when the mind is really still and watching things consistently that you can see things very clearly, precisely what's going on. To understand them more, then you might want to experiment based on what you've seen. You may notice that certain kinds of breathing are good. And can you recreate them? And are they good right now? And if nothing seems to work, we'll just go back and be very quiet again. We want to learn how to balance out, on the one hand, the fact that you're going to be active, and the other hand, on the other hand, the fact that you have to watch. Give things time to show their results. The Buddha talks about this in terms of the factors for awakening. There are some that are more active. Analysis of qualities, persistence, which means right effort, and rapture. These things energize you. In other words, you try to see what's skillful and what's not skillful. And if you see something skillful, then you try to encourage it. If it's not, then you try to discourage it. This means, on the one hand, if something unskillful has arisen in the mind already, you do what you can to let it go. And then you try to figure out how not to let it arise again. This requires some planning, an aspect of meditation that many people overlook. If you know that you're about to face a difficult situation, apply the, the end of the meditation period to that. So you're going to go into something difficult and you're probably likely to feel some anger or some lust or some fear or whatever is unskillful. If you're addicted to certain kinds of behavior, you can ask yourself, well, how does the mind give in, even though it knows that this is unskillful? What arguments does it finally get weak in front of? Arguments with itself. You need to think of some good responses, some good counter-arguments. Can you find alternative sources of pleasure so you don't give in to that kind of behavior? In other words, you have to sit and plan for a while. And that's for the things that already have arisen, when you can let go of them, then there's the development of skillful qualities in their place. You work on your concentration, you work on evaluating the breath so it gets more and more comfortable. This gives rise to a sense of refreshment. These things are all energizing. They're the active side of the meditation. Then you need them for times when the meditation is getting dull and lifeless. But then there's the other side. Sometimes the mind is overwrought, worked up, and analyzing things and trying to manipulate things just makes everything worse. This is when you have to be very still. Find a place that's relatively comfortable and just hang out. If the body's going to breathe, that's what the body's going to do. You don't have to get involved. Try to develop a quality of serenity, equanimity. Concentration. Patience. Give things a, a period where they can just kind of settle down on their own. 
because sometimes the mind is like a beaker full of water that's got impurities in it. And if you keep stirring around, the impurities are not going to settle out. But if you let the beaker sit there for a while, things eventually kind of settle down. And the impurities fall to the bottom or float to the top. And that way the water gets clear and you can see what's in there a lot more easily. So it really depends on what the mind needs right now, whether you want to approach it from the point of view of being very still to begin with, to give it a chance to calm down before you work with the breath. Or if you're feeling sluggish, do what you can to get things moving. You learn to read the mind's needs, you learn to read the body's needs in terms of breath energy. This way your skill becomes more balanced, and you develop a range of skills for dealing with different situations. Sometimes the situations are determined by events of the day, sometimes simply by the physical condition of the body right now. And as a skilled meditator, you want to be able to have an approach for whatever the situation. It's like being a good cook. You walk into a kitchen and whatever's there in the, in the kitchen, you can make good food out of it. So this means not having a doctrinaire approach to the practice, learning to feel things out, get a more intuitive sense of what needs to be done, where the mind is out of balance and how you can bring it back in. There's that passage where Saka, the deva, comes to ask the Buddha a whole series of questions, and one of them is, is equanimity to be developed or not? And the Buddha says, there are certain kinds of equanimity that are and certain that are not. And the, how do you know? You put them to the test. You notice, well, can I practice equanimity in these situations? Skillful qualities arise when I practice equanimity in those situations. Unskillful qualities arise. In other words, you don't take a doctrinaire attitude that equanimity is what you need all across the board. You get a sense of time and place. In this way, as you get more and more skilled, the mind does get into a better, a better state, more reliably into a better state. Because you learn how to maintain your balance. When you maintain your balance, it's a lot easier on the people around you. You're not falling on them all the time and pulling them down. So just this ability to maintain your balance is a gift. It's like that image of the acrobats, one standing on the shoulders of the other. Each has to look after his or her own sense of balance. And in that way they both stay safe. So finding your sense of balance is a gift. It's a gift whose effects ripple out, sometimes in ways that you might not expect. So remember, you're, you're doing this not just for yourself, but other people. There's sometimes you, know, if you, you don't feel up to it, you feel a little bit lazy. It's like that scene at the end of Franny and Zoe, where they remember how your older brother kept saying, well, tie your shoes, look good, do it for the fat lady. And never found out who the fat lady was. Each person had, each kid in the family had his or her own ideas about who the fat lady was. But I always remember, there, there are people who benefit from your skillful activities, both inside and out. And you're feeling a bit lazy about it, say, so, well, it's good for them. Maybe I'm not in the mood, but It'll be good for them. That gives you a little extra push. So that the gift you give is a really good gift. Something you're proud to give. 